Hey there, everyone. This is Aaron, and we're on episode two of Stop It. This week, the three amigos, Fraser Gartshore, Jerry Martin, and myself, Aaron Schaus, are taking you on a little bit of the backstory, the origin story, as it were, of the pipe organ. We hope you enjoyed the first pilot episode of this podcast, and we look forward to sharing more with you in the future about what makes the three of us organists a bit different from the rest of the organ world. Yes, we are the Organ Rebels, and this is Stop It. Stop it! Stop it! Welcome back. It's Stop It time. After the huge success of Stop It pilot version, episode number one, the three of us have decided to do this again. I'm Fraser Garchaw. I'm middle-aged and I'm an organist. I'm Jerry Martin. I'm middle-aged. I'm an organist. And I'm Aaron Schaus and I am not quite middle-aged and I'm also an organist. Well, that's it. The three amigos are back and it's time to continue our little rascal look at the world of organs and organ music. I think we'll start this little session having a quick run round the room and see what everyone's been up to. Aaron, what have you been up to this past month? Oh goodness, this has been a very, very much highlight month of my career. Um, I've had many things that I cannot talk about fully all the way, but I will say that uh, at least in the last few weeks here, I have um, played organ on a very big movie to come out later this year Uh, and I have also uh, worked with some a pretty big name or names uh, as well Um, I'm gonna be playing organ uh, well I have I recorded organ for um, a theme park that is yet to open as well so it's a unique unique gigs um, recording for entertainment purposes but uh, yeah using the organ in in fun ways and uh, doing things that I don't know how many other organists around the world are doing. Um, how many organists do you know that play, you know, in movies or play in theme parks? And I don't know many of them. I don't so. think that I don't think that exists. I don't think that's even a thing. I think you're a pioneer. Yeah, it's well the organ thing for for theme parks for sure. I don't know what. I mean, maybe Disney somehow has had a had a uh, organ at some point playing in something, but uh, maybe Haunted Mansion, of course, but. Someone had to record that. But um, no, as far as these these movies go, this has been a thing for a while. But um, luckily, the organ I got to play is uh, now called the Bar Fox organ. And it's a uh, Wurlitzer from 1928. And the organ uh, was used in many, many films uh, all the way back to the silent film era. And then later on, when Fox had it in the studios, it was used in films like Sound of Music, The Wedding Scene. Um, It was used in The Day the Earth Stood Still, uh, Patton. Um, Star Trek, the motion picture, Home Alone, um, The Witches of Eastwick, which is a John Williams score. Um, anyway, it's, it was been used through all of history. Um, and I actually heard a story last week about this organ that the, the man that played on The Sound of Music, the wedding scene in The Sound of Music on this same Wurlitzer organ, this is a true story, played that gig, that recording session, went home that night and then died of a heart attack. <gasps> isn't that, no, a, isn't that sc- so scary? Yes. So the sound of music wedding scene, the music you hear there, that man, that was probably the last thing he ever played on the organ. And he went home and died that night. Isn't that crazy? Oh, my God. Um, that, so I amazing. didn't die. I'm still here. I, I played. <laughs> I'm still, you know, I, I the organ. That means you have first, more work but, to know, do. <laughs> um, I have more work to do. Yes. So the organ has decided that I should live on. Um, but uh, but yeah, so that was that was a cool, cool trivia that I heard this week. Um, but anyway, it was, uh, so that was that I played for a movie and I will reveal later on this year what movie that is, um, and the people that I got to work with and, um, for this theme park thing. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so that's, that's highlights of my career. Um, and at this point, I don't know how I can top this the rest of the year. I probably won't, but (laughs) this is where we are. So that's Um, just amazing. How about, how about Jerry? How about you? You can tell us about your, your goings on. 
Oh my goodness. Well, um, actually, Aaron and I have some overlap this month because uh, we're recording this uh, in March. Uh, and uh, of course, with my Irish heritage, March is St. Patrick's Day. Uh, so we are, there's a lot of things happening in Portsmouth here in preparation for St. Patrick's Day, which is coming up this weekend. Uh, so I actually, we've talked about organ, but uh, I started out as a traditional Irish fiddler. So I'm playing in our local Celtic band for a couple of uh, events here uh, this weekend. But also, as I think we may have mentioned, my interest in music of, uh, particularly organ music of the turn of the last century, uh, Sir Charles Villiers Stanford, we remember 100 years of his passing, and he is like me, an Irishman living abroad. Uh, so I've been <laughs> really getting stuck into learning the music of uh, Stanford uh, this year. And uh, I've been working on a couple of live streams on my channel. So I'm preparing one of those that's going to be St. Patrick's focused uh, this uh, weekend ahead. Uh, so in addition to playing traditional Irish, there's going to be uh, St. Patrick's themed Stanford. Uh, and as if that wasn't enough, of course, Easter is coming early this year. And I'm very fortunate living in this small town that we have a very talented group of musicians uh, and a very dedicated uh, director of choral music. So we are preparing St. John's Passion for uh, Good Friday, which is a little over two weeks away. Um, and uh, oh, yeah, I have a day job, too, sometimes. <laughs> but uh, so that that's it. It's likewise. It's been busy. Uh, nothing quite to top what what Aaron just described, but a uh, lots of fun for me, nonetheless. Fraser, what about you? Well, I haven't been up to very much at all, actually. I've had a rather I've had a rather I'm not going to say a boring month because it certainly hasn't been that way. But I've been basically a stay at home dad all month. Oh, um, my my better half, Vanessa, she has been very busy with all sorts of other things this month. So I have spent a wonderful month looking after my baby daughter, who's coming up actually for one year now, which is quite amazing. And on top of that, I've just been I've just been doing what I always do, playing live streams on YouTube, playing the piano, teaching the odd bit of music, trying to practice music in the background, and chatting to you guys. So for me, it's been a very quiet month musically, but I don't think it's going to stay that way. I don't think so either, because I know you have been accumulating some toys and with toys comes ideas and plans for future shenanigans. So we're looking forward to hearing all about that in the future. Oh, dot, dot, yes, dot. yes, yes. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Well, there's an awful lot of exciting things that have been added to the Garchor arsenal of um, audio equipment, shall we say. And there's a very, very exciting reason for that. And uh, yes, more on that very, very soon. Oh, well, there we have it. A little roundup of what the guys have been up to for the past few weeks. And uh, yeah, it seems like I'm the boring one now. I'm the oldest. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously just being a boring old guy sitting at home looking after kids while everyone else is gallivanting around the world, doing exciting things, playing for Hollywood music, playing Bach, St. John Passion. I'm not actually very jealous about that. That's a huge work and that's an awful <laughs> it's a lot, lot of work. practice. It's, it, that's, that's pretty epic stuff to be doing. Is, I mean, are you guys going to pull this off? Yes. I pause there because there's always the I wonder <laughs> and there's always that, you know, right up until the moment of there's that. Oh, my gosh. What are we doing? Um, but yes, somehow it all comes together. So I'm going to say based on past successes. Yes. However, I would be lying to say that I'm not anxious about the whole thing. So yeah. let's I, I'll report back next month. <laughs> I remember when I was studying and uh, part of my studies was obviously conducting. And um, for some reason, all of our professors, they insisted that we learned about uh, these grand works by J.S. Bach, the St. Matthew Passion, the St. John Passion, etc., etc., the Mass and B minor, all of these huge, huge, huge works. Um, and we had to learn them. And we actually had to learn parts of them by memory. If you're going to be a conductor, all oh our my. guys said you should learn these things by memory. And uh, I was forced to learn some of the recitative parts of the St. John Passion by memory. 
And oh my gosh! That, yeah, exactly. Now, thankfully, that's that's well over thirty years ago now. So it's long been forgotten. Well, it's not actually. It's about thirty years ago. But it's long been forgotten. But yeah, I'm not jealous of anyone who has to perform that, especially the conductor. That's a huge work to hold together. Yeah, it it really is a lot for the conductor. For me, uh, so I actually never got to do a lot of classical ensemble playing growing up. So that's been something new to me here in Portsmouth. So I'm the organist, mm -hmm. and I get to hide. I would like to say hide, but the organist never really gets to hide uh, mm -hmm. because uh, there is that absolutely hilarious video out there somewhere of some unfortunate organist that had the transposer on during the Hallelujah Chorus, and uh, those last chords were just not fun at all uh, because the organ, you know, yes, it blends beautifully with voice and orchestra, but if you hit the wrong notes, oh my gosh, the whole world will know about it. Uh, so Charles yes, I, I get version. to be... <laughs> yes, so I get to be uh, I get to be, of course, the continuo, uh, which means <laughs> I get to pretty much play continuously the whole way through, right? Pretty <laughs> much. Well, let's we're, yes. we're, we're moving we're moving towards organ in the church again, and this is exactly exactly what this little stop it session shouldn't be about. And actually, Aaron, right. you already mentioned it today. You were talking about organs in theme parks talking about organs yes. in studios, in cinemas, in films, and things like that. So maybe something we could talk about today is something, a little, a little history lesson of the organ, maybe not going all the way back to the beginning and certainly not going too in-depth about it all, but we mustn't forget the organ did not start out as an instrument for the church. That came relatively late in the organ's development. If you look at the entire development of the organ, going back to ancient times. And when we say ancient times, we mean pretty much ancient Egypt. Aaron, over to you. Oh, goodness. Uh, can I go back that far? Um, <laughs> well, um, I know... <laughs> Not personally, for, for obviously. Fact, I know for a fact that the organ, uh, in its first inceptions, um, was made to entertain, as were most instruments. They were all made for entertainment purposes. And that's what people uh, look for uh, when, especially back in those days when life wasn't too great. Um, and they were looking for ways to escape and music was the way to do that. Um, and so the organ was one of those, one of those things that uh, was a way to, um, I guess, get the crowds enter energized and going. And um, that has carried on through to today. Um, and I'm not sure how this is in, in Europe, um, but you know, organs are still used here in sporting events. And um, you know, if you go to a baseball game or a hockey game, uh, you will oftentimes hear an organ uh, playing between the, the game play. And uh, this is kind of where it all came from. Um, and it's, uh, um, it's, um, it's, it's always been a, uh, a, an instrument that has gotten the crowds going. And um, yeah, I, I think that uh, it's, it, at some point in the, I guess it was the ninth century that everything sort of changed. But yeah, if you want to go back that far, I mean, organs, um, I, I can speak at least to the, to the Greco-Roman areas uh, where it was all water powered and uh, these it weren't they weren't complex instruments as they are today but um, they were just certainly um, very loud and everyone enjoyed hearing them and uh, yeah that's kind of my, that's kind of the earlier parts of it I don't know about Egypt how, what what are the, what's the Egyptian part of things Fraser as far as I remember the the original the hudraulis hudraulis however you want to pronounce it yes um, I think that originated in ancient Egypt didn't it does anyone mm. remember anything else. My brain is just, was, um, t my brain reminds me that it was of, Egypt, I think. Yeah, I was thinking sort of the, the, Gre the Greeks and the Romans, but maybe it was before all that. But it would have, it would have been before, before Christ, for sure. That would have been B.C. Um, yeah, I would have said probably, I don't know, 3rd century B.C., BC something like that. It was, uh, if I could look up on a, uh, you know, a Wikipedia article, <laughs> be, be fact-checked here. <laughs> oh, no, we don't but, want to um, do that. We want to be spontaneous. <laughs> But, absolutely, um, absolutely. No, I mean, but they were certainly the first keyboard instruments, isn't that right? You know, certainly long before pianos and harpsichord and everything else, the very first keyboard instruments were organs. So uh, that's kind of where it all began. 
And uh, as far as an instrument that was capable of producing tones, you know, we talk about polyphony, you know, many tones or many sounds together, you know, the predecessor of the modern synthesizer and every uh, recorded music to this day. Uh, I'll chat a little bit about this uh, later on, but, uh, you know, even how pipe organs were used before recorded music was uh, mainstream. Uh, so organs, yeah, absolutely have always been part of uh, entertainment. And it's so fun to think about this and explore this side of the instrument that for many folks, people just think about being in the church, right? It's, uh, it's just amazing. Yeah, I think what was probably the first time that the organ moved from the entertainment venues into the church was probably the ninth century, sometime in 800 something. And it was Charles the Great uh, in Aachen, Germany, which is not, I guess, not too far from where you it's are, a, maybe. I don't know, Fraser. It's about an hour and a half from here, yeah. Yeah, that was the first, first time that it was, uh, I think it was gifted or something that was, it was put in the church uh, there and uh, has ever since been somewhat in the church. And um, yeah, from that point on, it was, uh, I guess, thought of more as a very serious spiritual instrument, I guess, of some sort. Um, and uh, it's, but I think has also retained its other qualities. And as we um, moved along through the centuries, um, you think about organs that were used uh, in parlors or in people's houses that had a lot of money mm. um, for entertainment purposes. That was for concerts and, um, you know, gatherings of friends and things. And so it was a, the fact that it could cover all the sounds of a big ensemble of instruments um, was kind of its, its key that, it, that one person could do all of these things by themselves. Um, and I guess you're going to save money, too, if you're not going to have, you know, to hire a bunch of players to come play at your party. You can have one person come play. Um, exactly. And it can sound like a big group. Um, and uh, but yes, as far as, you know, playing at sporting events, which is, has carried through to today, um, you know, it's, dun -dun, it's dun -dun, the reason dun -dun, it's so big dun -dun. is that it can make such a it can make such a big sound. <laughs> yes. And um, it can be big enough that, uh, you know, out played outside in front of large crowds. It can be heard. Um, just like bagpipes, which is another one of those instruments that should only be played outside. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, the times that I've had to play funerals with an organ and bagpipe, and they have the bagpipe player standing next to me at the console of the organ, oh you're thinking, this is an instrument used for wartime. You know, you're exactly. supposed to have the bagpipe play across the hill over there to scare the army on this side of the hill. Um, you know, and here we are <laughs> exactly. inside, in, inside walls playing this thing. Um, yeah, but uh, no, the, the organ... Um, <laughs> the organ is is one of those things that uh, can be loud enough to to play outside, um, but as we know, can also be very very quiet, um, mm -hmm. and has a huge dynamic range. Um, but uh, yeah, so I would say you know originally um, entertainment purposes outside um, and for large crowds, um, and then later brought inside in the church. Um, anyone want to? Sort of. Well, talk on I more think about if, that, if, if you want to talk about large crowds and maybe entertainment in a very, very loose sense of the term, my um, <laughs> my definition there. Uh, but yeah, whether it's a, an arena full of people at a sporting event, whether it's a concert hall full of people uh, going to see a concert, whether it's whether it's four hundred people sitting in a church praising God, it's you know one instrument is capable of accompanying, but also drowning out. Um, you know, all, it's, it's, it's capable of so many, so many things. It's capable of creating emotions and uh, stirring emotions. And I think that's, that's the, the beauty of the organ as an instrument. Uh, interesting you mentioned yeah. something about people having organs in their private homes. Jerry, you were recently yes, yeah. at someone who has an enormous organ in his private oh, home. In fact, oh, indeed. And, doesn't and he that, have a that private legacy. home around his organ? I think that's probably yeah, the easiest way to say it. Pretty much. So we're talking about one of the largest, uh, certainly here in the United States, maybe even one of the largest home installations in the world. So the home of Dr. Uh, Eugene Blackstone, the Blackstone Residence Pipe Organ. And uh, he's a physician who had, uh, throughout his entire professional career, began with just collecting small amounts of pipe work in his uh, original home. And then when he moved up to Cleveland, uh, had this beautiful custom home built and the organ continued to be expanded. And it's just a magnificent instrument. But that is not without precedent. And that's that's something that really fascinates me as we've been talking about the organ as uh, an instrument of entertainment. Uh, so, yes, you can think of the organ in the church. Uh, and I think uh, organs were commonly maybe brought into play when, 
you know, we didn't have uh, big orchestras and whatnot. You had a single player, single instrument that could fill a space with sound uh, and just transport people away, uh, which is just truly amazing to think about. So here in the United States, we have the great tradition of the organist that I'm passionate about, uh, who brought great symphonic works to essentially town hall organs uh, around the United States. Um, and then, of course, we had fairground organs and we had uh, uh, and continued to have um, uh, organs in, in sports fields and whatnot. But I am really interested in kind of the history of the residence organ because these instruments um, were not just designed to be played by a physical player. Of course, they certainly could. Um, but these instruments really came into their own in the, you know, think about the Roaring Twenties and right before recorded music took off. Uh, so you had, uh, you, if you visit pretty much any of the big stately homes in the United States, think about the Biltmore down in Asheville, uh, you have pipe organs in these homes. Um, and most of them, in addition to having a console that you could play, had a player mechanism whereby uh, and you had uh, uh, recording houses that made these basically vacuum reels. So it's, it's punch paper uh, that was loaded into these machines and they could play recordings that were made by Lemaire and Hollands and all of the rest. Um, in fact, I'll just mention briefly, I a bucket list item for me. Uh, there's, did you know, actually guys, did you know that the Titanic had a pipe organ. Yes. <laughs> so it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't just the uh, the the players who played uh, "Amazing Grace" while the ship went down. There was a pipe organ on there too. Um, but the sister ship, the Britannic, never really took sail. Uh, but the organ from the Britannic exists today. And Ooh. I was just looking this up. It is actually in Switzerland, uh, the Museum <gasps> no. for Music Automaton uh, in <gasps> Siwen in Switzerland. Oh uh, so they have they have the pipe organ, which was basically the twin of the organ that was on uh, the Titanic. And these organs, of course, they would have been in the big ballrooms, right? So yeah. uh, maybe in between, you know, you would have the, the band playing or you would have big band playing. Uh, but then you would also have these orchestral numbers played by, you know. So instead of Le Maire having to set sail on the Titanic or the Britannic, <laughs> they had paper rolls of his recordings, which they could load up and play. And these instruments are so historically interesting because fully restored today, the Britannic organ, they actually have a series of these scrolls recorded by Le Maire and all of no. the rest, uh, where you can actually hear those organists play with their registrations, uh, their cadence, all the rest. Just absolutely amazing. Um, and this is preceding vinyl or phonographs and, and all the rest. Basically, this is MIDI before MIDI was cool. Uh, which is yeah. is just absolutely fantastic. But not only were these organs on steamships, but they were in people's homes, and you could imagine going to the Biltmore, and maybe they didn't have a visiting organist, so oh, we're having a little evening soiree, so we're going to listen to some Strauss and whatnot, and you would just pull those rolls off, load them onto <laughs> the instrument, and then that would play while, you know, dinner was served or, you know... <gasps> While the, the sherry was passed around and whatnot. Just just amazing. So this is an absolutely fascinating side of the pipe organ that people don't think about. Uh, but uh, just really, really interesting. Well, you've, just, you've reminded me of, I th I'm not sure if it's one of the earliest residential organs, uh, certainly one of the most famous, uh, Blenheim Palace in, in England, where, where the Churchill family come from. That organ is from the 1800s. It's, it's yes. an organ that's playable by a player, but it's also playable via um, rolled, uh, paper rolls. I yep. think actually now, it's in, th in that case, it's wooden rolls and things like that. But um, that must is, have been one of the, the first of the largest Is this the organ that has been played by a player on this uh, podcast? Is that right, Aaron? Yes. You played yeah, it, last, right? Last year. No. Last year. It's in Oxfordshire. Yeah, Oxfordshire, yeah. you say it. Uh, it's, uh, but I, I, went up, I went there um, January of last year in 2023. And um, yeah, I gave a concert there of, of film music. Um, no! and it was the organ, oh my God. the organ there, the organ there is part of the tour of the palace. It's sort of toward the very end cause it's in the library hmm. and, um, yeah, it's, it was, it's a Willis organ and, um, it's amazing that it's still, you know, mostly functioning. And, uh, I think people usually go through those tours and hear, like I said in the last episode, the top 10 composers <laughs> uh, that people play on the pipe organ. Uh, but when, when I was doing it, it was, uh, there was sort of a little bit of a crowd that gathered. 
Um, I was playing Harry Potter. I was playing John William, all John William stuff, Star Wars, and um, did some Henry Mancini. And uh, anyway, it's kind of cool to to do that on this instrument that I think was intended to be this this thing that entertained people that were there in the in the, the library. Um, but uh, it was it was pretty incredible it, that to, to know that that these instruments, um, you know, they were purchased not to be in a church they were purchased to be in someone's home mm -hmm. um, now obviously it was usually for the people that were that were much more well off that could afford these things um but with that with the advent of things like Hauptwerk, i mean it's 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 now playable in anyone's you know home if you have exactly absolutely. You, know, you don't you don't need you know six figures of <laughs> money to buy an, an instrument you can do it in your own home for much much cheaper um and uh yeah it's pretty incredible that 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 that's that was a a custom um that has kind of fallen out of fashion um but uh, these organs still exist and i guess that was kind of a big thing too with music like uh one of my favorite composers from from the romantic era uh le febre hmm. uh, you think about his music is is i love his music so much and it's um it's definitely him trying to do <laughs> um, parlor or opera or fun, you know, party right. music in church, <laughs> yep. you know, and uh, it's it's incredible because he was translating all those things that you would hear during the week at parties, you know, and playing on Sunday morning. And um, <laughs> Can you imagine? It was just so cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> imagine going to San, San Sulpice on a Sunday morning. He was organist in San Sulpice, don't forget. And yes. Now, okay, he wouldn't necessarily... Would he have had the Kavai Call organ to play on? I'm not sure. He would have had the predecessor, I think. Mm, Is that right? Was. I think there was a predecessor. Yeah. But could you imagine yeah. going and hearing sort of all that wonderful march music, waltz music, uh, sort of yeah. bolero music, uh, crazy stuff during a during a church service? Actually, here's an interesting thing. We're talking about organs that weren't designed for the church but put in private homes. But I can think of one example of an organ that was designed for a private home but ended up in a church instead. Mm. Mm. Jerry's nodding. I, I can think of a couple too, actually. Ooh, um, I'm wondering which you. one you're thinking about, actually. I'm thinking, so, of, well, first I'm of, all, thinking of Paris. What are you thinking about? Okay, so I'm actually thinking of England. Oh. Uh, so, because one of the instruments that I've been enjoying as a Haupt, for example, set recently for Stanford, and it is perfect for that, uh, it is the Armley Schultz uh, <gasps> in St. Bartholomew's oh, in yes. Leeds. And that instrument was designed for a private residence by the Schultz Company. It was one of the f earlier instruments that they brought to England at a time before the Willises and everything had taken off. And yeah. uh, ultimately, that organ found its way from the private residence into uh, into a church, which is where it exists today. Uh, but that instrument was instrumental in informing Willis and how he approached mixtures and some of the big flutes and whatnot. Mm. He, he kind of studied the Schultz uh, German craftsmanship. So the European, <laughs> that, that was kind of how some of those sounds made it to England. But yes, that precedent exists where an organ might have been built for a private residence and then... Um, you know, well, honestly, here's another example. There's no organ in this private residence, but here in Portsmouth, there is a magnificent home on top of a hill here uh, that was built back in the 1920s. And uh, the original owners and designers did not live long enough to enjoy it. So the building was donated to the church. It became a convent. And then <laughs> time moves on. The nuns left. It was bought and it's now a private residence again, but they're renovating it and they've opened it to the public and you can go there and stay as a bed and breakfast and whatnot. But one of the things they were so excited about as they brought me on a tour of that residence uh, was, and, and I the current owners didn't fully understand what this was all about, but I was just <laughs> geeking out about this. Uh, it has a pipe chamber in the basement. And these homes, uh, you know, when they had these pipe organs installed uh, here in the States, rather than necessarily having the pipe work out in the open, they would put them in a pipe chamber in the basement mm -hmm. or nearby. And mm -hmm. then they would have this conduit. So there was this uh, great big open space, almost like an air conditioning vent with a curved ceiling that opens via a grill, a perforated wooden <laughs> grill, into the dining hall. Or, or uh, so what they were, they weren't really sure what to do with it. But they had realized that it had acoustical properties, and they put a Bluetooth speaker down there just to uh, <laughs> enjoy it being projected out into the space. Oh, so it's a 1920s amplification, but that allowed all of the uh, the pipework to merge. Anyhow, just architectural curiosity. 
curiosity. Uh, but going back to the idea of homes being built and organs being put in them. So tell me about Paris, Fraser, because I'm not sure my brain is uh, triggering with the one you're thinking Ooh, about. Oh, I see. Okay, well, let me ask Aaron if he knows which organ I'm talking about. Um, I don't think I do. No, Ooh. something in Paris. No. Yeah, the 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 modern. I'm going to say modern because it's not that modern. But the second organ to be put in Sacre Coeur, one of the largest and most famous churches of them all. I've that organ mm. started out life as a private residence organ, mm. and it came to Sacre oh Coeur much later. The, it was one of the last Cavaille call. Um, organs to have been completed. It wasn't actually completed by Cavaille Call. There were other bits added afterwards and things like that. And it was in this private residence and the organ in Sacre Coeur was in such a terrible state. They obviously wanted a huge Cavaille Call organ because all the other big French cathedrals are in and around Paris had a Cavaille Call. So they said, right, well, we'll have this one. Thank you very much. And the organ from Sacre Coeur was originally a residence organ and now it's one of the most unheard instruments in the world sadly because my gosh does anyone know why you hardly ever hear the organ in sacrica no no idea ah sacrica is basically 24 hours it's a 24 hours seven days a week church service it never stops it's one of those places that oh, has really? the eternal it's an eternal worship as it were whatever you want to call it i can't remember the actual term okay. for it uh, but it's one of those eternal worship so the organ very rarely gets played properly it hardly ever gets tuned there are very few recordings of it there are never any concerts on it etc 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 but it's one of the most amazing cavalli call organs in the world and it should it deserves wow. to be heard more crazy amazing. story 24 7 in church wow. wow that does sound like that's just amazing <laughs> do we want to do that i don't know <laughs> I can think of some people who might want to. I can as well, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. It's, it's an amazing place. If, if the three of us ever make it to Paris together, which I do hope we do one day, um, we, yes. must, we must see if we can sneak ourselves into and onto the organ in Sacre Coeur. Um, it's, it, it is te theoretically accessible, but we'd have to play something liturgical on it. We wouldn't be allowed to play Henry Mancini or John Williams or... Okay. Or, or Stanford's Danny Boy. We wouldn't be allowed to do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, a Aaron could probably play a meditation on something and hide the melody. Actually, both of you could do that. <laughs> oh, that, that would be, be a good fun. I, I did yes, that the exactly. other week, but I'm not going to tell you what melody I used. It was rather naughty. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> so apart from um, you being used in you know homes and in coliseums and arenas, what other places can we think of that the organ is used that is apart from the church? Concert halls, obviously. You, you, you see them in, um, played with orchestras sometimes. Either they, you know, people think of the Saint-Saëns Organ Symphony mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as having a, uh, having a large organ part for that. Um, yeah, so theme parks is not a place that I normally think of for organs, but I mean, you, you don't see the organs usually there unless it's sort of one of those sort of grinder organs, you know, the smaller right. versions. The but, fairground organ um, kind of thing, yeah. Fairgrounds, yeah, yeah, that's another mm -hmm. another version. Um, and uh, actually, the, the organ stuff that I recorded this week that was for um, the theme park uh, is sort of that carnival sort of music. Um, so oh, it was cool. sort of being, it's going to be used in that way, but it's the organ that was used as a Wurlitzer organ. So what other places can we think of? I guess, of? I guess I mean, here's now an interesting question leading on from, from Aaron's thoughts there is as we're trying to think about historical and unusual places, uh, organs have been, and perhaps actually I'm now thinking cause it's approaching lunchtime and I'm like, Hmm, pizza, <laughs> the American pizza parlors that pizza have parlors. Wurlitzer pipe organs. And there's yeah. a couple of those that, you know, it's basically the Wurlitzers that were rescued and it, it became became a thing here in the States, and there are several of them in the US. Uh, my favorite is Organ Stoff Pizza down in Mesa in uh, just outside Phoenix. That is just amazing. Um, but I guess here's the next question. Where should we bring the organ now that we can with technology and Hauptwerk uh, load it up in our truck Ooh. with some speakers and go to unusual places? So um, actually, I don't know. Maybe our maybe our listeners have some ideas. So that would be interesting not a bad idea. But actually, when you said loaded up on trucks and taken around the place, don't forget the world of the touring organ also used to happen. Yes. Um, I think one of the most famous was the old. He was he was actually. Well, he moved, I think, to Canada, but he was originally a British organist, Reginald Foot, and he had this huge mm. five manual Muller organ made for him, uh, but it was Goodness. transportable. It was an enormous five manual Muller 
a theatre organ. It landed up in, I think, as far as I know, Pasadena. Uh, Aaron, you must know about this oh, in the Civic wow. Center in, uh, in Pasadena. Is that not the organ that's there in the Civic Center there? there. The, 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 I, I think yeah. that is the original touring organ from Reginald Foote. And that was, you know, five huge trucks were, you know, would travel around the country. This was in the States. It would travel around the country and the organ would be sort of assembled every night. Concerts would be played, then it would be dis dismantled, put back in the truck and off they went again. Um, and I suppose they, I don't know where they did this, hockey parks, you know, I'm imagining it was large car parks basically but right. open open air events and there are some open air organs out there aren't we we're thinking of san diego yes san there's diego. one in kufstein in austria just across the border mm -hmm. uh, can anyone think of any other open air organs i don't know it's difficult because of temperatures and things it is yeah. difficult um, and of yeah, course that, you have that the, is uh, and and the, the zero although you're in the open air the zero acoustic I think you've both heard the organ in San Diego live, and it's just, it's the most yes. dry, it, crisp acoustic. It really is. It's, it doesn't lend it, itself it requires, to organ music, uh, does it? It requires special <laughs> technique to play it. Um, but actually, when I visited that organ and got to hear it play, just amazing experience. But I loved uh, reading a little bit about the story, how uh, when that organ was initially commissioned, most of the organ builders refused. They wanted nothing mm. to do with it. They said, this is not possible. This can't be done. Yeah. Um, and then the I think it was the Austin Organ Company finally stepped up to the plate and said, yep, we'll do it. And uh, <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> it's still there. Amazing. Really amazing. It is, isn't it? So where should we take organs next? Well, we've got private homes. I suppose you have schools. There are some organs in hospitals, believe it or not, in well, mainly mm. a hospital chapel, I suppose, but there are some yes. in, in, in hospitals. Um, any kind of religious establishment, um, arenas, parks, on There's the road. I think we're kind of running out of ideas. Yeah, there's an organ in one of the underground stations in London as well, and I've played that one. <laughs> It's sort of it's oh, that's right. From the church, yeah. Well, it's just it's just been put the... there not that long, a couple of years ago, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's one of the yeah. sort of and free to play kind of things, isn't it? Like the pianos dotted yeah. around train stations, that kind of thing. Yes, there's a little box, and then on the wall, you push the button, and you get 30 minutes of air that that turns on, and you get to play it. It's kind of cool. Oh, that's um, amazing! I would love to see that at some place. point. So that's the kind of thing. That, I mean, train stations and you know bus stations and things where you usually will see a piano. You know, people can play boogie woogie and things, but. Um, <laughs> That's a that's a place where you know the potential for organ to to be seen and and people to know that it, it exists outside of the church, um, you know that's one of those things that could be a really cool high traffic area, um, and I think that's kind of a big part of what what needs to happen is that since it has been in the church and in the concert hall, is that people haven't seen the instrument in other places enough you know enough times to know that it can function other places, mm, um, right? And yeah, yeah, I think that's a big part of it. And it's, I mean, if you even if you own an instrument, say say you own a guitar. You're much more likely to play it if it's sitting out somewhere where you can visually see mm -hmm. it than if it's in a case somewhere or put somewhere in a back, in a back room and you have to go <laughs> get it out to go practice it. So I right. think that's another, another big thing to have have it being physically seen in places um, to kind of bring it back into uh, the public light, I think. So, um, wow. yeah. yeah, but that's that's. I think that's kind of the next place that it needs to go. It just needs to be seen in more public places. So all um, of these, mm -hmm. all of these disused organs in churches. What we need to do is we need to get them out of there. We need to get them installed in open public spaces where they can be played freely. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Wow. I know. Let's let's get some of the small instruments. Like get them in the wine bars and whatnot. I mean, how cool would that be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be cool. Wine connoisseurs and then people in the background playing books to Huda. No, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hmm. So you would have the wine snobs and the organ snobs meeting in one place. I think that would be, you know, opportunity for cross pollinization, sharing of ideas. <laughs> Do we want that? <laughs> yes, we do. Of course we do. Of course we do. <laughs> to be continued for for future conversations, indeed. To yes, be continued. Indeed. But I think, yeah, Jerry, you 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 asked the question already. You know, listeners out there in listener world, comment. Let us know. Let us know where do you think where would you like to see or hear an organ yeah. be played? And yeah. let's, and perhaps let's some of our international friends are. Are there unusual installations that you know about that we should talk about um, that would that, yeah. that need to be heard more about? Uh, you know, it's 
Uh, again, it, historically, it has been such an important instrument. And I think one of the, so uh, Fraser, you mentioned about the touring organ. So I was actually just thinking about uh, perhaps one of the more recent performers who was famous for a touring oh. organ was Cameron Carpenter Cameron with Carpenter. his touring organ. Um, and I actually had an opportunity to hear him uh, during one of his U.S. tours. Uh, and he was making a point of trying to visit places where pipe organs were not uh, mm. or where, uh, you know, where folks wouldn't be likely to hear that. So uh, I was in, it was when I was working at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, but he did not come to Lexington. He visited Danville, which is a small uh, liberal arts college town, perhaps an hour south of Lexington. So way out in the countryside. Um, mm. So he brought his touring organ. They installed it in the college auditorium and filled that uh, auditorium for a couple of nights with folks that would never have heard um, uh, and you know the music he proceeded to play yes he did play some of the <laughs> traditional standards but then he morphed into we had theater he played blues he played uh, you know Gershwin uh, and people were just left amazed so we yeah. we need uh, folks to do that kind of thing and, and we can certainly do that with modern uh, technology um, but yeah, the, I, I think part of the issue with folks bringing touring organs out is historically, as organs got bigger and bigger, before we got into the modern era where we have uh, computerized technology to help us, yep. it would be rather hard to bring a wonderful Keva call on the road because it's not just the tons of pipe work and tracker action and everything that goes with it, but it's also the acoustic, uh, which is so important. However, we're now in a modern era where we can bring simulated versions of yep. that and can be very easily loaded up on the back of a truck and brought to a <laughs> wine bar. So definitely, there's a challenge, a challenge that's, for our fellow organists out there. That's true. Actually, am I not right in saying, Jerry, you actually have or at least you had, I think you've donated it to the local church, but you have a semi-portable Hauptwerk installation, is that correct? Yes, yes indeed. You know, over all the years, uh, my Hauptwerk installation, much like uh, I currently have a PC that is ill and in, in pieces on the floor upstairs. Well, likewise, my, my Hauptwerk projects, there's the main one I use, but Hauptwerk is so modular that there are, it, it's been through various iterations. <laughs> and uh, yes, the, that most of the bits of that are down at the church. Um, they were uh, the, uh, they basically replaced the Kilgan while she was out of action last summer. Uh, but that uh, portable, I've actually played Hauptwerk outside in the garden for the birds, yeah. because why not? <laughs> there you go. And did, did, <laughs> There's a video did, on the channel, yes. <laughs> did the birds disappear or did they stay and listen? So, well, they disappeared at first, but then they came back and they said, whatever, we're just going to keep eating our seed and getting out with our business and just let that nut just did be nuts play, with the squirrels. Did you play Messiaen too, though? <laughs> oh, my gosh. What a missed opportunity. Aaron should be grinning from ear to ear at this point, you know, about birdsong yes. and Messiaen. It's just wonderful stuff, right? Oh, goodness. Yeah. If, if, for those that don't know, yeah, Messiaen's music is often based in birdsong, yes. And... Uh, I have had uh, teachers in the past who were so fascinated by such things that you would find them along the college campuses staring at trees, <laughs> listening to the birds, trying to, <laughs> to interpret these songs. Um, yes. <laughs> Oh, the fun times yes. of college years. But um, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> that's that's the thing is you can take it virtually anywhere now. And yeah. um, with the modern technology, you can you really can play the organ anywhere. And that's I think it just takes the right the right mindset of, of those that are willing to do these kind of things uh, to carry it into new and creative places. Um, right. Because that's that will that's what will help it survive is that it has to be in the public eye as it has always been. Um, but I think a topic for future episodes is uh, how it has how it has gone the other other way uh, for right. many years. But uh, that will be a future future discussion. Ooh, yeah. and I, I, indeed. Now, and as I'm kind of thinking about my thoughts on you know what what is it makes the organ so special? Well, there is so much you know the history, the variety of music, what it's capable of. Um, but you know when people who know who don't understand the difference between the piano and the organ, for example, ask <laughs> me, you know, well, is, is it just oh you've got three pianos to play? Um, well, 
there's there's um the organ is so much more multi-dimensional i mean the you know every instrument has its dimensions whether it's you know loud to soft and low pitches to high pitches but uh the really amazing thing that you can do with the organ compared to other instruments is how you can layer sounds together right so uh our multiple manuals and divisions so you're basically in control of an orchestra whether it's a big mm -hmm. band or a symphony orchestra um, and certainly there's organ music for its own right but that is what's so wonderfully gratifying as an organist is that you really can be a one-man band and yeah. uh, that is that is something that is really special about the organ whether it is a completely traditional pipe-based instrument or one of our modern uh, you know sample-based instruments and all of the other weird and wonderful organs that exist in between in those spaces. Uh, but that's what's special about the organ is the ability to layer sounds together. And it gets your brain thinking in a very yeah. different way uh, where you're actually being, you're kind of responsible for multiple instrumental parts at the same time. You know, the bass line, the accompaniment, the melody and everything in between. And uh, it's just so much fun. And that's that's really what uh, what the public needs to grasp or what young musicians need to grasp is, is that uh, that creative opportunity out there. I think we've all had the we've all been in the position where there's been that little anecdote. I've had it several times. I'm sure you have as well, where you've been playing an organ where the, the console is visible and the pipes are detached miles away and somebody will come up afterwards and say, oh, how does all the sound come out of that little box? Meaning, <laughs> of course, the console. And then you point up to the, say, ah, oh, well, the pipe work. What do you mean pipe work? Yes, those are pipes, organ pipes. They're, they're making the sound. What do you mean? But it sounds like a clarinet, but it sounds like a trumpet, but it sounds like this. I said, no, no, it's all per perfectly capable. But So this box is not making any sound. No, this is just controlling the sound. It sounds miles away over there. I think we've all had that little comment at yes. some point. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and yeah. it's it, and it, it is wonderful. Uh, I, I my favorite comment. Well, first of all, I think as musicians, we one of the things that unites us. It, music is wonderful, but when you connect with another person, you know, when you play something and somebody comes up to you and says, "Wow, that was great," or you transport them away for a little bit, but all the more when they come up and say, "I didn't know the organ could do that." Mm, yeah, that's the best one. Mission accomplished. That's it. Those are my th those are my favorite comments on any of my YouTube videos. When someone <clears throat> writes, "Oh my goodness, I'd never heard anyone play that on the organ before. I didn't know I didn't know it could do that. I thought the organ could only do X Y Z." Yeah. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, well, as we're coming to the end here, I am actually recording my contribution on a new toy and. Yes, I like. I, I don't just like uh, music, but I like all of the technology that goes into that. Um, I am currently recording this on a Zoom H4 Essentials, which is a 32-bit float recorder. Oh my gosh, what oh. is all of that? Well, I think we should talk about some of the fun technology items that we all enjoy uh, and how it interfaces with music, because I think this is also going to be super important for the future of organ. Um, I don't know. I think we should come up for a name for this segment. What do you guys think? Do we have any ideas? What are we talking about all the, sort of the kit we use? For example, where each of yeah. us are using AKG yeah. microphones and each of us yeah, is recording exactly. those microphones on a Zoom recorder. Are we looking for sponsors yeah. for the channel? I think we are. Oh, but maybe yes, you're right. I think we, we might name. be looking for sponsors. But yeah, but I, yeah I mean, so our, our podcast is Stop It. But what? What what are some ideas, uh, Aaron? You you kind of come up with fun you're ideas. Good with, you're good with we're good with words. Oh. You've oh, got goodness. that silvery well, tongue. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> I think I think a while back we were talking about something, and and this is before before we've been recording today. But um, Fraser, you mentioned the most watched TV show of all time. <gasps> uh, Top Gear. Top Gear. <gasps> oh. Now, oh. Idea, I think I, I know where this is going. Yes. yes, and that is the fact that since we are called Stop It and we are involving the organs and organ stops, why don't we call this section, wait for it, <gasps> Stop Gear. Oh, yes. Stop Gear! Vroom, vroom. Yes! Stop <laughs> Excellent. Gear. It has to be. It absolutely has to be. Oh, my goodness. All right. Me. I love Stop it. Gear. I'm in. All right, Me definite too. future future Boss. segment. So um, I think we could probably go on for hours. So what we're going to have to do is we will have to maybe make a short list of some of the cool tech that we use. Or you know, like I said, I've got this cool new recorder. What's cool about it? Why why is thirty two bit float relevant to the organ world? So stop <laughs> gear, watch this space, definitely, <laughs> yes. or I listen to it. this space even. 
listen to this place. Ladies and gentlemen, that has pretty much been our second episode of Stop It. However, we have already planned our third episode. What's coming next, ladies and gentlemen? We are going to introduce you to why on earth we decided to take up this bizarre instrument. Who inspired us to take up this bizarre instrument? And more importantly, why are we still doing it after all these years? Indeed. That does it for episode two of Stop It, an Organ Rebels podcast with your hosts, the three amigos, Fraser Gartshore, Jerry Martin, and myself, Aaron Schaus. We hope you've enjoyed this look back at pipe organ history and how the organ has survived for millennia, and we hope we'll continue to survive for many, many more years to come. Unless there's some kind of apocalyptic event that occurs that we, you know, we can't guarantee whether or not that will happen. But anyway, this podcast comes out once a month on the fourth Saturday of the month. So check back in with us in April and we'll see you then on Stop Stop It! It!